Um, hello, this is Vicki Matranga at the International Housewares Association. Welcome to our webinar today with Kim Kersher. Kim was set to speak at our um, show at the at the Inspiring Home Show at the In Innovation Theater. And so we're grateful that she's joining us today to share um, her knowledge about health and wellness and nutrition um, with insights from current situation. Kim is a registered dietitian and certified personal trainer. Her unique background includes leadership, program development, direct patient care, and spokesperson experience in agriculture, supermarket, media, and hospital-based health and fitness centers. She was vice president of the National Dairy Council for five years, focusing on the integration of agriculture, sustainability, health, and nutrition. She has served as president of the Illinois Dietetic Association and was named Outstanding Dietitian of the Year by the American Dietetic Association. She'll be speaking to us today. Um, and if you have any questions during, the, uh, during her presentation, you can submit your questions through the chat function and we'll take questions at the end. These webinars are recorded and remain on our website. So you'll be able to catch Kim again in a day or so on the inspiredhome.com. Uh, so go ahead, take it away, Kim. Thank you so much, Vicki, and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you to Vicki and team. As you said, it would have been wonderful to see you all in March, but I'm thrilled to be spending this time with you today and talking about a topic that has always been very important, but I think we could probably all agree that it's even more important than ever. And the goal today is to have an informative but not prescriptive conversation about how we really connect and build trust and relationships with our customers. And when we talk about that, we always want to start at the beginning. And so I'm going to bring us back to the beginning several times throughout our time together today. We will be talking about a topic. We will be talking about audiences. And we will be talking about what that means from our resources and assets and how do we make this all come together. And when you think about the topic of health and wellness, I think it probably goes without saying that wellness is personal. And everyone defines things differently. And I think sometimes that's the tricky part and the fun part, at least for me, to figure out what's that path forward and how do we have those individual connections with people while we still appeal to the most people that we can and yet not lose that individuality. And so when we start this conversation today, I would love to ask you all to think about what health and wellness means to you, both personally and professionally. I think sometimes when we're in the business of health and wellness or well-being, it's often easy to get caught up in the moment from a business perspective. But now today, we're going to still do that we're going to appeal to our audiences in new and fresh ways. And we're also going to think through what this means to us when we ourselves are shoppers and how do we connect with the brands and services that we're looking for for our own individual needs. This is actually from IRI and it's, it's hot off the press as you, as you can see from the date. And when we think about what this means, I'm not gonna read this all to you, you can see what it says on your screen. But really people are seeking comfort right now. And it's a wonderful time for us in the business of health and wellness to really showcase what we stand for. One of the best things that we can do that I love at this, this tip is to reevaluate our messaging through a new lens and ask if it's still meaningful. In other words, was our storytelling resonating prior to the current scenario? If yes, fantastic. If yes, but maybe there's a little bit more that we can add to really resonate and show how we're helping solve problems in today's situation. And maybe it was a, you know what, this moment in time is an opportunity for us to really rethink what we're offering and include that how-to information, those action steps that people need to take to be successful with what it is that we have to offer. So I mentioned that we were gonna be talking about starting at the beginning. And when you talk about health and wellness, we need to think about what it means to say a healthy diet. And if we were in the room, I would ask for a show of hands, who would want to volunteer? What does this mean for you? And for the sake of time today, and for the sake of the conversation moving forward, this is a definition that I love from the World Health Organization because it's very inclusive. It helps take a very complex global conversation and make it tangible and actionable for us in our business. 
And what I mean by that is it level sets the conversation and it brings it to a place that I think we can all agree on. It's essential for good health and nutrition. It supports our efforts against non-communicable diseases like heart disease and diabetes and cancer. We're eating a variety of foods. We're reducing our salt and sugar and saturated trans fats. And we're also including, I'll say it again, a variety of foods from all the different food groups. And this is a very inclusive definition that still has those moments that are evidence-based, they're science-based. And when we think about the personal definition of health and well-being and how people define what they choose to eat and why, this definition helps us all stay on the same page and it helps us start at the beginning of the story. Now we're gonna look just at the word healthy. I always love to say that the definition of health and wellness or healthy continues to evolve and get bigger and bigger and bigger. I will say this probably a zillion times during our time together, the definition of healthy and health and wellness is personal. So when you think about that question I asked you, what is your definition? What is your audience's definition of this? And this is where we start to build relationships because we start with understanding and understanding and acceptance and understanding how our definition and what we have to offer aligns with what our audiences are telling us is important to them is an incredibly important step. And I will tell you that's one of the fun things about health and well-being from a, a, from a professional standpoint is words matter incredibly. And the words that we choose to use to connect with our audiences matter so very much. And in our storytelling, we don't wanna just say health. We don't wanna just say healthy or health and wellness. We wanna take just a quick moment to say, this is what we mean and this is what we have to offer you. And that feels like a lot. So I'm gonna start giving you some tools to help organize your thinking. And again, this is not gonna be prescriptive. It's going to be informative. And so as we're talking, you can think through that definition of healthy. What does it mean for you? What does it mean from the past? What does it mean now? Has it changed? And right now we're gonna start talking with our audience. This is actually from FMI just a, a short time ago. It's from a wonderful bigger report. If you've got time to dig into it, uh, that would be a, a great step for you to think of. But for sake of time today, we're gonna start at the bottom of this pyramid and we're gonna say, okay, the conversation about food and nutrition used to be, am I going to have enough? Will I make it through the winter? I think a lot of people around the world are still having that conversation. But fast forward, you could say when agriculture came into play and all of a sudden, a safe, affordable, abundant food supply became a year round wonderful choice for us, we could have the luxury of a conversation about what does this particular food or food group do for me? What are the attributes? What does this nutrient of calcium, for example, or protein, what do these actual things do for us? So now you've got two buckets. They're both still happening. Do we have enough? And what do these choices do for me? Then you pop into the top of that pyramid and you've got a group of people saying, tell me everything. I wanna meet the farmer. I wanna understand what's happening on the farm. I wanna understand where this is being grown, why it's being grown that way. What is the packaging story? Literally tell me everything. And these are important moments to consider because again, it is a health and wellness, very personal individual conversation we need to bucket our conversations. So when we take that step back to say, is our message relevant? Who are we talking to? What are we trying to convey to them? It's very helpful to have these buckets of people and know that these are the different conversations that our messages need to resonate with. And that again, is foundational to building trust and relationships with our customers. And trust matters to all of our audiences, and I'm using air quotes with that, and it's a two-way street. And some of you might recognize this. This is actually from the Edelman Trust Barometer. And again, I won't read you every bucket, but let me give you a couple of highlights. When we think about who we're talking to, our employees want to trust that they can be proud of where they're working. Our consumers or customers want to trust that what we're offering and the company's values line up with their personal values. They want to trust that there's a solution that will help them solve a problem. When you look at the media, 
they are partners in storytelling, helping people understand and connect with us in ways that expand our storytelling and so on down the line. So when we talk about trust and we talk about our audiences, it's really nice to not only think of those three tiers that I just showed you, do we have enough? What does it do for me? Tell me everything. Those three moments through these lenses are going to help you focus your messaging and help you feel like, how is this coming across? not just what I want people to know, but what are they gonna use it for? And all of that is foundational, again, to building a solid relationship. And you might think this is new. It actually isn't. That is not a typo where you see the blue arrow on your screen. We've been talking about building loyalty with health and wellness from a, a retail or industry perspective for a very long time. It's one of the reasons as a dietitian, I loved working in retail for as long as I have because it's where people make their decisions. And when you talk about purchasing, oftentimes we talk about price, and we'll talk more about that in a moment because that's absolutely still essential. But this is not a new conversation, and that conversation builds a bond that is way beyond price. We're providing solutions, and this is where I want you to start pivoting your thinking. Instead of health and wellness as a marketing program, what if we could think about health and wellness as a customer service opportunity? And taste is important. Price matters. This has been true for a long time and probably will continue to be that. And so I want you to ask yourself, what is your story and these two buckets that we know people want to hear about? Taste and price. If it's delicious, people are going to be drawn to it. If it is price and budget friendly, especially right now, that's very appealing too. So let me just throw a couple scenarios at you. Do you manage food waste? Is there something where you're helping prolong storage of food either before or after it's cooked or both? Do you enhance flavor without added sodium? Is there something that you're doing that's an attention grabber that you can have that conversation coming in from a taste and price perspective that is absolutely health and wellness. And I will tell you as a registered dietitian, back in the day when I first became a dietitian, we called this managing your food budget. We called it using everything that you buy. Now in the farm to table world, a lot of times people are calling it honoring the harvest, making sure that we're using all of that food, still managing food budget, but now we're also saying, wow, if we manage and use everything that we buy and put it to good use, that's health and well-being for us and our food budget, and it's also good for the planet. So I just want you to extend your thinking a little bit and challenge yourself. How do you use taste and price to drive a health and wellness conversation? Because that is a win-win-win, if you will. And so let's keep talking from that food and taste perspective. For fun, I wanted to go back to 2018. I'll show you 2019 and 2020 as well. But when you go back and look at Google's most searched recipes of 2018, this is what you'll find. So a little shout out to Brussels sprouts and the veggies on the list. But as you look across these 10, I think we can all agree that we're looking at comfort foods. And we wanna make sure that in our conversations from a health and wellness perspective, it's been very easy in social media to get caught up in that conversation, but what about shopper data? And I'm gonna show you a little bit more about that in a second. What about searching data when it really comes down to a recipe that someone wants to cook? They're actually taking action. What are they looking for? This list is primarily comfort foods and you can see a good representation of all food groups. Bring that forward into 2019. You can see that that continues. There's a lot of interesting things on this list. I think there's a lot of comfort foods, and I would say we could probably all agree that they're pretty common ingredients. So when we think about comfort foods and we think about where people are, this was 18 and 19. Now going to this IRI data that I'm showing you, this is from around the world, the United States is to your right. And if you look down that list, I think we could see that there's still a steady drumbeat of comfort food. So what does that tell us from a health and wellness perspective? Well, oftentimes what the science says and what people are doing don't always align. And it's not new, 
this year to consider that what people know, say, and do might not always match. So from a health and wellness perspective and a storytelling perspective, there's still absolutely a need for a storytelling perspective on balance and portion control and how people match up what they want to do for their personal health goals with their individual lifestyle choices. And this is where it gets interesting because even within the same person, you might have someone on their birthday define health and well-being a very different way. There's an absolutely place for a piece of birthday cake on a birthday. And those are the kinds of moments that make us authentic in building relationships. It's not prescriptive to people, just like I'm not being prescriptive for all of us today. It's more listening. What are we hearing? What do they need from us? Where are they? What does the science say that they need? Because my plate on the left of your screen, choosemyplate.gov, is actually the visual representation of the dietary guidelines for Americans. I love this visual. I think it's a very uniting factor when you think of all the different personalities around a dinner table right now. It's a wonderful way to say everything a person could possibly choose to eat and that a farmer is growing is represented in this very simple visual that represents complex scientific concepts. So if you haven't checked out that website or you haven't thought about it that way, I would highly recommend that you do that because using something so simple that is based in science is absolutely how we're going to increase not only understanding, but action steps. And this might still seem like a lot because we know that we can't be everything to everyone and that is okay. If you look at this, this is from um, a bigger chart again too. So if you've got time to, to dig into the uh, PDFs that I've given you and the URLs, this one's from Hartman Group. But wait, look where I put that blue arrow on the screen. People want to do some of their own personalization. And so if you think of health and wellness as a long-term race and a relay race, we're passing the baton, giving them the information about here's who we are, here's what we stand for, here's what we offer in products and or services, and make it very understandable about the solution that you're offering, pass the baton to your customer, and they will then know how to use it to meet their personal goals. So it's a really fun way to think about that. We often think about collaborating with other experts in the field. That's important too. But we, if we can think about a customer service and a partnership and relationship here's what we're good at, we're hearing what you need, and here's how we're gonna to work together to achieve those goals. So let me give you a more tangible example of that. This is actually also from Hartman, it's about Gen Z. And this is a funny conversation to me because you do not have to choose between healthy or flavor. Is it better for me? Is it a good choice for me? Or is it delicious? Imagine a world that we as solutions provider and product providers can help people find their way to it. And it might be a portion control conversation. Maybe we're making cookies. And why would that decadent choice fit into a health and well being pattern? How does it fit into that choose my plate visual? Where do those decadent choices fit? How do you balance your choices the rest of the day to fit that cookie in? Those are the kinds of conversations that we can have with people to say, yeah, maybe this is not an everyday choice. Maybe this is a treat for your birthday or a holiday. Here's how you do it so you can still stay aligned with your health and wellness goals over the course of the day or the week. And we have a lot of opportunities in today's world. This is from IRI, again, hot off the presses. People are eating at home much more obviously than they were, whether it's takeout and delivery or it's actually cooking. So in today's world, we have a lot of meal and snack opportunities to connect with people. So one of the biggest things that we can do as we're rethinking our messaging and our tools is if we have recipes, do those recipes offer everything a person needs to know from the time that they're choosing their foods and shopping to their kitchen, to the storage, and how much they're going to get from making that recipe? So can we th rethink our recipes and not necessarily have resources to develop new ones, but say, 
what are the shopping tips that we can give people? If a person were to walk in today's grocery store and the cut of meat that they want or that specific vegetable is not available, are we giving them tips on how to substitute? If it's a boneless versus a bone in, and I just wrote a blog about this, how does the cooking time change? Not that much, but have we given them information so when we connected with them at that meal and snack time, they know how to adjust on the fly. And then when they cook it, what if it's a bigger portion that they bought because it was a great sale? Are we helping them use those other ingredients? Are we bundling recipes into families that say, hey, you bought chicken this week. Here's three recipes for chicken. Or hey, you bought fresh parsley. Here's 13 ways that you can use that fresh parsley. How are we helping them use all that they buy? How are we helping them bring those tastes that they love into action for more than just that one moment at that one meal? Sounds like a lot. And there's a lot of attributes that those recipes can bring to life. So this is another tool. I promised you a lot of tools today. One of my favorites is from 2015. I show this to retailers. I show it to agriculture experts, healthcare experts because it's a wonderful visual reminder that when we are talking about health and wellness and it's a personal conversation, at the center of our focus is that individual and we're interacting with them how they interact with their food at meals and snacks. So visually, if you think about the pyramid I gave you, we've got our three buckets, if you will. Do we have enough? What does it do for me? Tell me everything. Then we talked about price and price and taste being big drivers of interest for people. And you can start to see how this wheel focuses and brings that all together. So we've got our person that we want to help in the middle. And then price, taste, and convenience, you can see to the side. And then health, wellness, safety, social impact experience, and the transparency tell me everything. This is a wonderful values driver way of helping you tell your story in ways that you're saying, okay, I want to focus on price, but what are these other attributes that I can bring in to really tell a full story? If you think about watching a movie or reading a book, isn't it more fun when there's a couple of plot lines going on? It's almost like if you think of health and wellness as a couple of different plot lines going on, it all of a sudden helps you know like this is on sale. This is where it came from. It's in season now. This is why you would want this equipment. Whatever your story might be, what are the moments that hit on more than one of these buckets that you can share with people to bring that health and wellness humongous conversation to life in a very focused way? So I mentioned a lot of topics here. It can seem overwhelming. The farm to table conversation is still important to people. I've showed you my plate, choosemyplate.gov. It's now on the right side of your screen. On the left, this is also from the USDA. When you're doing a farm to table story, it's incredibly important to have those experts come in. And when you want to build an authentic storytelling relationship with people, a long term relationship with people, including aspects from the farmers themselves in this particular case, is essential for building trust and authenticity. And there's wonderful resources, whether it's websites like the snapshot that I'm showing you here, or you prefer to follow on Twitter, you can actually follow the USDA MyPlate and Farmer information on Twitter, on Instagram, whatever your platform of choice is, maybe it's multiple, but who you follow and how you position your stories and who you collaborate with is part of the health and wellness story now. And that's something else that hopefully I'm, I'm mentally hearing you all breathe a collective sigh of relief. We don't need to be everything to everyone. We need to be the best that we can within the scope of our expertise and then build our networks out so we can help them tell their story and they can help us tell ours. And I promised you more tools. So this is another one. Let's look at this from a health perspective. It's the same topic. Remember those value drivers that I gave you. Health and wellness was one of those values. So if we look at this in a more traditional way, this again is from FMI just last year, at the top of this list, when it comes to making choices benefiting health, cardiovascular or heart health is on the top of the list. So let's go back to the start of our conversation when I told you health and wellness is personal. Yet we want to cast the widest net and be the most appealing that we can. So this is going to sound funny, but it's the truth. 
everyone has a heart. So what is your heart health story? And if you can focus on the heart health story or attributes that you offer, you are casting a very wide net to be very appealing to so many people. And when you wanna talk about the personal management of heart health in an authentic way, perhaps someone has high blood pressure or high cholesterol, or perhaps a heart attack just happened in their family, whether it was themselves or a loved one. Helping people make informed choices that support heart health is incredibly impactful because heart disease has been the number one cause of death for men and women around the world for quite some time. So if you wanna talk about focusing your resources on one aspect that helps everyone in a family, this is a wonderful place to start. So let's take that down to a food perspective. This again is also from the FMI just last year. And when you look at the long bars, we absolutely have some farm pieces to the health and wellness conversation. We absolutely are looking at shopper data, product claims sought when purchasing a food product. If you think about heart health, low sodium, high fiber, no trans fat, we could go down the list and pick many, many things that are related to that particular conversation. What is your message doing in this space when it comes to purchase drivers from a heart health perspective? And then from the agriculture perspective, if that's part of your story and maybe you're not a food company, what's your energy story? What is your packaging story? There are always those moments that come into play and there are experts within those categories that can help you tell that story as full as you would like to do that. But when it comes to traditional heart health, there's a lot that we can do that is very impactful. And it's very easy to get caught up in social media chatter. And on that note, there's been a lot of talk about clean and clear label. I want you to think about the world we live in right now. And when you hear the word clean, what does it mean? I'm guessing you're thinking hand washing. You're probably thinking a little bit about food safety. Perhaps you're thinking a little bit about washing dishes and storing food properly. That is the clean world we're living in today. So let me give you an example from a simple ingredient perspective. And this is gonna take you back to where we started in our conversation to say, how are you using your words? Is your message the right one right now? So I worked for Juul for a long time. So this is just from them. I'm, I don't work for them now, but this is screenshots of not only products, from the marketplace, but their ingredient list from that same site. Popcorn is a whole grain. We often hear that we need whole grains. The ingredient list for popcorn is popcorn. That is a simple ingredient list, very clear. It's fun, it's tasty. There's our taste conversation, pretty budget friendly. No matter your cooking skills, you could make popcorn, delightful. Let's move to the middle of the screen. You saw the data from IRI. There's a lot of people cooking who hadn't before. You're looking at fresh ginger and you're looking at the convenience recipe ready ginger in a jar. Both of these are delightful choices. The ginger didn't even have an ingredient list under it, which is why you don't see one. And the recipe ready ginger in a jar has two things, simple ingredient list. And the reason I wanted to show this to you is because in parentheses, you can see an explanation of what that other ingredient is doing. What is the benefit to that for that product? The why it's in there. So as again, you think about what you do, what you offer, product and service, what is the role of everything that you're offering? Is it a taste? Is it a convenience? Is it a nutrient? Which brings us to the last example of that. I worked for dairy for a long time and one of my favorite things to say is, you know what's in milk? Milk and a couple of vitamins. So when you think about the use of the word clean previously and how people are using the word clean now, this is a chance to talk about simple ingredients and to help people with the how and why of what they're getting when they choose that product. So again, we're starting at the beginning. This is what you wanna do as you're thinking about this webinar and what you're hearing from a health and wellness perspective. What are you known for? What is your definition of health and well-being nationally, regionally, locally, and I would say globally too? 
what collaborations can you bring to life both internally at your company and also externally with third party experts and don't forget that we're also collaborating with our customers the very people that we're in service to and then measuring success successfully it's a funny phrase to put it that way but we want to make sure that our metrics are correct for what we're trying to capture in this relationship that we're trying to form so it's a really simple checklist and really, from a solutions provider perspective, what we're trying to do is help people find what they need, understand it, and use it to meet their personal goals. If we can keep this simple thing in mind, it's going to help us focus, in addition to those other tools, to focus your audience attention and to focus your topic attention. So on the spirit of another tool, there's, this is another way to look at it. We've organized our audiences, we've looked at our, our values drivers, this is a wonderful way, again, from FMI, uh, that just manages categories or topics. And as you look across this, this was in 2019, there are many, many things that still ring very true. My challenge to you is to look at these buckets and ask yourself, what is your story now? What other things do you offer that is a food safety perspective, health and wellness in general, social good, inspiration, and discovery. There's buckets here that, from a topic perspective, line up wonderfully with the values perspective um, from the, the circle chart that I showed you earlier. So the whole goal, as we're kind of winding down, and I'm, I'm curious to hear your questions and, and comments, is we really want to keep it simple. We want to make sure when we're talking about health and wellness and wanting to be authentic, that we're using shopper data, not just conversation data. What are people actually searching for when they're looking for recipes? What are they searching for in terms of solutions? And what are they looking for when they come into a store to make their health and wellness decisions? Aligning our communication with those food groups from the MyPlate, making sure that we're helping them see how balance matters, and really thinking through everything like a problem solver. I can say working retail for a long time, People come into a grocery store because they need something and they know that there's something in there that will help them solve the dilemma that they've got, whether it's dinner, whether it's the weekly meal planning that they're doing now. They come into a store with a purpose. And if it's a grocery store, an online store, a, a something, a, an equipment store, we have a solution. Let's make it really simple for them to find why this is going to help them achieve what they want. And again, don't forget, it might be recycling and packaging. It might be energy conservation. There is a broad array of values-driven topics that meet health and wellness-specific interests, and we can speak about them through an editorial calendar and really thinking through, what's my story? Where can I achieve maximum um, attention during the course of the year, whether it's Earth Day or Diabetes Month, but really rethinking not only the message, but when we're delivering that message. And really taking a, a new look at Choose My Plate as well. This came out in 2011 to really kind of replace the food pyramid, if you remember that. And when we think about the personal health and wellness eating style, I really feel that this visual does a beautiful job of being a science-based way that unites different eating styles and honors every single food that we all choose to eat. It's farm to table eating. Food comes from where it makes sense to grow and raise it. And every farmer produces a food that someone is eating. So we're supporting farmers and they're supporting us. And you can bring this tool to life in a very actionable, simple to understand way. So our goals are really to maximize our resources Think about both our shoppers and our employees, because right now, customers are more interested in what we're doing for, for our employees than maybe they have been for quite some time. And we want to help them plan their entire journey. When we think of our customer and we think about what they're trying to do, it's not just that moment that they're eating something, it's their selection process, their shopping process. So going from their shopping to their kitchen, to their table and beyond, that storage factor, enlisting experts across that process. If we collaborate with additional storytellers and we can partner with people, we are going to tell a more authentic story and we're going to build that long-term relationship that is really what health and well-being is all about. 
So I really appreciate the, the chance to share these tools and ideas with you. Well, thank you so much again for joining us today. I'm really looking forward to hearing your questions and comments. Thank you, Kim. That was wonderful as usual. You always have such a great blend of insights and information. Um, it seems as though we don't have any questions that have come in from the audience. So I'd like to pose a few if you don't mind. Um, you commented. That would be fantastic. Um, great. I, I really like the way you brought up um, the differences between what consumers say and what they actually do. And you, you know, brought in the sales and, and searching um, uh, results to, to prove your point. So I thought uh, maybe it would be good to sort of backtrack a bit and summarize what you think um, um, people in this industry should do to rethink their approach to health and wellness. Thanks, Vicki. Yes, I think this is a really important question. And that's really what I wanted to inspire today is Oftentimes when we're trying to approach a topic that we've been working on for a long time, it's a really interesting exercise to go through and rethink it. So one of the best things I think you can do is start by looking at what does success look like? If you had to define success and report out what happened with your health and wellness efforts, how would you like that to look? Because then when you've given yourself what that outcome is, all of a sudden, what metrics would be relevant to that picture become very clear. And then we also know how we need to look at our messaging to see if how we're talking and how we're sharing leads us down the path to that, that vision of success. Okay. Um, also, you mentioned in a few places about how today's conditions are, are causing people to rethink a lot of things. So. Um, people might find themselves in a situation where they need to reach out to experts outside their current network. So you mentioned a few experts, perhaps you could um, continue with that. Yeah, that's another one of my favorite topics because the collaborative approach right now is more essential than ever because the content with the space continues to broaden across the food supply chain. So one of the best things that I think can happen is if you have a call center, really comb through the types of calls that you're getting. And, and most often we categorize those types of things. And really what gaps you have if you've got consistent questions coming in. And that's one of the most tangible pieces of data that you can use. And then really thinking about what organizations are credible in that space. And for the farm to table conversation, the USDA was a great place to start. There's many others. If there's farmers in your network already, Having conversations with people and experts that you trust that are already in your network oftentimes can lead you to that diversity in the network that you need for yourself. So I would say it's kind of twofold. Check it to see what kind of feedback you're getting from your current customers and what gaps are existing in those answers. And then reach out to your network and say, hey, who do you know in this space that's an expert on topic X, Y, Z? And then all of a sudden it becomes very focused and very clear on how to start building that out. Great, great. Um, so, you know, following up on your earlier um, um, description of marketing messages and re repositioning health and wellness, going beyond product, how can people think of it more as a service for their customers? Yes, one of my favorite topics too, especially right now, because when we think of ourselves as problem solvers and solutions providers, all of a sudden we start to think more in terms of a, a long-term relationship and having that trust and loyalty over time. So really thinking through that health and wellness interaction as a marathon, not a sprint, if you will, and that starts with word choice. So taking those moments to look at what you've communicated over the years, how that's resonated. Lots of times we have focus groups. Were there any words that tripped people up? What was the feedback in social media? How are things kind of happening from that? You can learn a lot from your marketing when it comes to thinking about this from a customer service perspective, because the beauty of marketing is it's your storytelling platform. And when you start to mesh the, the channels of marketing and communication with the content expertise of the folks who know the information that your customers want to know, all of a sudden it becomes a much easier and quite frankly, more fun job. And it's going to resonate better because you've used your vehicles for communication to deliver the messages that people want to hear. 
Great, great. Well, um, I have one more question. <clears throat> These days, each one of us is developing new habits and new ways of doing things, everything from uh, the way we shop, cook, and eat. So um, what do you think going forward, what habits do you think will stick in terms of lifestyle after the current scenario transitions into some kind of new normal? As an optimistic professional, I always like to look for the silver lining in things. And when I see how many people are cooking and experiencing that at home, how many people are, are trying to get their kids in the kitchen to help, I'm very optimistic that cooking at home will become a more consistent part of, of more people's days. And then using everything that we buy, that is something that from a food budget perspective, it's a really great conversation. But from an agriculture perspective too, it really honors the natural resources that have been going into producing the, the foods and the products that we're using. So I really think using all that we buy is going to also, in, in alignment too with cooking at home, those two habits collectively and separately, I think will stick around for a little while, at least that's my hope. And then flexibility in what we try. We're seeing lots of reports about people going to grocery stores and being inspired either by need, that's what, what is at the store at the time that they go, or maybe they're faced with something that they never thought about before, just out of necessity for putting a meal together. And I think the, the willingness to try new things will be seen as an adventure that I think a lot of us will have so much fun and impactful conversations with people because sometimes it takes moving us out of our normal routine to see that there are other possibilities. And I'm really optimistic that those things are gonna stick with us. Oh, that's great that you're so optimistic. And the audience might be able to pick up on your uh, frequent reminders about agriculture that you have farming in your in your family background. So that, that really gives you special insights into these issues today. Well, I thank you once again, Kim, for your, your wonderful presentation. And I wanted to alert the audience that these programs, uh, the IHA webinars, uh, remain on our website. So you can listen to Kim again or, or share her information with your, your friends uh, by going to our website, which is the Inspired Home Show. Com. And we're booked with webinars through the end of May, twice a week. So please check our listings on what's up ahead. And meanwhile, speaking of experts, Kim is certainly one of them. And uh, you can see her contacts on the screen right here. She's a very active blogger and has a lot of expert opinion um, opinions and leads on her website. So I hope you keep in touch with Kim. This is Vicki Matranka for the IHA. Thanking you for joining us today. And we'll see you next time.